before God. Second Samuel six twelve through twenty three. Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half-naked in the full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. What truly matters in our lives is the concept of value. What are the values I consider important, and what is an unwavering value? For someone who thinks appearances are important, it doesn't matter how important appearances are to them, because with age, the value of one's appearance will deteriorate. And for someone who values knowledge, it is a good thing to be knowledgeable, but as time goes on, that same knowledge you are working hard to attain becomes nothing more than common sense or meaningless information. And for those who value money, you will only be okay when you have money, but if you were to ever become poor, then you would lose your confidence and you may even commit suicide. True unwavering value lies within being able to stand in the presence of the Lord in worship. No matter how much money you have, if you cannot worship before the Lord, you will end up feeling miserable. Even if you have an overwhelming amount of knowledge, if that knowledge interferes in worshiping God, then you would have been better off never having attained that knowledge. People's values all differ from one another, and thus everyone views life differently. When we look at amazing people, that is, people who have accomplished many things, we can see what it is that they value and prioritize in their lives. These people have the ability to distinguish between what should be done first and what should be put aside for later. There are two ways to plan our lives. The first way is to prioritize time first, and the other way is to prioritize importance first. Everyone on earth is alike, and there is no one who is particularly good or bad. Every one in a million years, sometimes even one in every thousand years, God creates geniuses. However, most people have three IQ numbers. Everyone is similar to one another in this sense. However, every person's life is different. Why do you think there is a difference in people's lives? It's based on how one prioritizes their time throughout their life as they live. It depends on what they put first and if they decided to take action based upon that value. Everyone knows that time is important. As some say, time is money. But after time passes, the time you spent and lost can never be recovered again. Because of this, you may feel sad and regret things you did. There is an interesting saying about time. To know the value of a year, ask a student who didn't make it into their college and is in trouble. To know the value of a month, ask the mother who had a premature birth. To know the value of a week, ask a weekly newspaper editor. To know the value of a day, ask a daily worker who leaves six children at home. To know the value of a, an hour, ask lovers who are waiting for each other. To know the value of a minute, ask someone who just missed a plane.
to know the value of one tenth of a second, asks the silver medalist for the track event at the Olympics. Depending on whose perspective we look at it from, even the shortest period of time can be very precious. People who all have had great accomplishments share something in common, that is, the ability to distinguish between what should be done first and what should be done later. Stefan Covey wrote a book called First Things First that categorizes the things that are happening around us into four categories. First is important and urgent work. Second is important but not urgent work. Third is unimportant but urgent work. Fourth is work that is not important or urgent. Usually people will prioritize spending time on things that are neither important or urgent in their lives. For example, some people will talk on the phone for two to three hours, and other people will never miss an episode of their favorite show on TV. An entire day can be spent on nothing but looking at one's smartphone. Teenagers especially will often spend the entire night playing games. Again, all these things aren't important or urgent. At first, spending your time doing these things may be sweet like cotton candy, but in the end, it will have been a terrible waste of time. Wise people will spend their time on activities that are important but not urgent. Think about this. What is important but non-urgent for believers? It is important to read the Bible, but it is not urgent. Praying is also important, but it is not urgent. Because of this, we often push back things like these in our lives so that, even if you believed in Jesus for years, your faith would never grow any stronger. However, those that do do these important but non-urgent things, such as praying, reading the Bible, studying the Word at church, or going to worship, will have significant spiritual growth after 10 years. The power of their faith will change, and the quality of their life will also change. People who do do these important but non-urgent things will become disciples of Jesus who may be living on the earth but live for the hope of heaven. The reason I can't reach my goals in life is because I valued the wrong things. It's because I spent too much time on things that weren't important or urgent. A person who ends up like this is like an athlete that ran aimlessly. Without any specific goal in mind, that person will become breathless and tired. They'll sit down, exhausted, and wonder, (sighs) Why did I run so hard like that? Many people finish their lives just like that. However, the Apostle Paul did not simply run without direction. As he ran, he looked to the cross, and before death, he confessed, saying, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which is the Lord, the righteous judge, who will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all, who have longed for his appearing. 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. I have said much about 2 Samuel. In chapter 6, through the cause of Berezusa, I spoke of the idolatry found in churches, and when I had finished, I had found some regrets, so I went over the text again. When David moved the ark to the city of Jerusalem, he was dismayed by Uzzah's death, which had occurred at the hand of God. He gave up the ark to the house of Obed-Edom and gave up on relocating to Jerusalem. After David had found out that the house of Obed-Edom had been blessed because of the ark's presence, he attempted to relocate the ark to Jerusalem again. David did not have the knowledge of the law previously, so he had carried the ark on a cow and the entire trip ended in a huge failure. But since he knew how to properly carry the ark this time, the priests put the ark on their shoulders as required by law to carry it. Thus the ark entered Jerusalem safely. When the Holy Spirit was there with the ark, David forgot about being a king and danced his clothes off. The entrance to the ark was the most impressive place of worship. The ark successfully entering the city was no simple matter. It was an event to celebrate. Everyone danced and worshipped loudly, praising God upon the ark's arrival to Jerusalem. To worship is to invite the Lord into your heart. When he enters your heart, He becomes your king and reigns over you. To accept this as a truth is to worship. To worship is to experience the presence of God within you. When the Lord is in your heart, everything that happens to you becomes worship. When the Holy Spirit came upon David, he danced for joy in front of the ark. When the ark entered Jerusalem, the impression of the Holy Spirit came to David. 
At that time, David wrote a poem, which is Psalm 24. Psalm 24 is a poem of worship. This is what Psalm 24, 9 to 10 says. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory, the Lord Almighty? He is the King of glory. In the Korean version of the Bible, ancient gates is put as eternal gates. When the Bible refers to ancient gates, they're not talking about literal gates. These gates represent one's heart and all the traditions and customs you hold within it. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Revelations 3.20 Warner Solomon was inspired by this statement and painted a picture called Christ at Heart's Door. A key point of this painting is the fact that there is no handle on the outside of the door. Someone has to open the door from the inside. Paul Washer once said, The human heart can only be opened from the inside. Jesus does not forcibly open the door to our heart. God desires our salvation, but it is our duty to open our hearts and receive him. I stand outside the door and knock. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus stands outside the door and knocks. He is waiting for you to open the door from the inside. What happens when you open the door? If you open the door, I will keep all the promises I have made to you. I will enter into your heart and become your Lord. My will will dictate the laws of your heart. I will become yours and you will become mine. You will humble yourself and work for the purpose of God. I will teach you. I will test you and I will guide you. Everything that distracts you or tempts you to be bound to this earth will be removed. I will watch over you and project my image onto you. There is holiness in my image. You must live a life full of holiness. I will warn you in advance. The moment you open the door to me, you will have to close the door to anything else besides me. If you answer me saying yes, amen, then you will have to say no to the rest of the world. To gain God is to lose the world, but heaven will be guaranteed to you. Everyone, will you open the door or will you lock the door to your heart? Paul Washer Many people do not open their doors because they're stubborn in their ways and value the things of the world, so they lock their hearts to God. There are two kinds of doors. One is the door that locks from the inside, that is, the inner door. The other is the door that locks from the outside the door to a prison. For the inner door, if you close your heart without opening the door, you will lock yourself out and become a sinner because you would have rejected both God and yourself. As for the door to a prison, if the door is locked from the outside, you can't come out of the prison from the inside, even if you tried, just like the souls of those in hell. It's because the door is locked from the outside, and the Lord holds the key of David, so if he closes the door, then there is no one else who can open that door. When you open your heart, the glory of God enters. God is capable of war. He destroys my wicked self and the evil habits within my heart. He destroys Satan's hold on me with the power of the Holy Spirit. Open the door to your heart. When you open the door, I, the Almighty, will go in and eat and drink with you. I will live within you always. Amen. Next, David blessed the people after the ceremony of the ark was over. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. A burnt offering is a sacrifice in worship of God. Fellowship is where the sacrifice is eaten together in a shared meal. Usually, our worship ends with a benediction. When people hear the benediction, they immediately think that the worship is going to end soon, when that is not how it should be. At the end of worship, we should bless each other with a heart full of grace and love. We should embrace each other, shake hands, and bless each other. Let us not be in a hurry to leave as soon as benediction is over. The food prepared for lunch won't go anywhere. It is much more important to bless each other than to hurry out of service. If we receive grace, it is time to bless one another, because at that point, we have received the blessing of God, so it is only right to then bless each other. 
Now, even if we are hurt, we are not to resent and curse others. We have become people who can share the joy in our hearts. This is what the end of worship should be like. The end of worship is to leave church as a person who has received grace and blessings. My experience at the end of worship service so far has been when, where I feel strangely reluctant to part with everyone. I want to bless everyone. After worship, I would like everyone to bless one another. However, as soon as service is over, there are people who rush out so others won't see. This is a result of bad worship. Rushing to leave after a service? That's something you don't even do in theaters. If worship has ended and your mind is empty, it is a failed worship. You should be filled with the grace of heaven. If you have finished worship and your heart is not filled with the feelings of wanting to bless someone, it is a failed worship. Worship is to experience God and share that grace. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. David was so filled with grace when the ark entered Jerusalem that he began to dance. The Bible says that he danced with all his might before the Lord. The Latin phrase, coram deo, means in the presence of God. True to this phrase, to worship is to look towards God and go before him. When you don't go before God, but go before the people instead, this is coram ominibus, meaning in front of people. This means that the worship has failed. In the book of Acts, there is a large crowd of priests who caught up with Peter and the other apostles. The priest said, Do not tell us in the name of Jesus, but why do you preach the name of Jesus throughout the world? At the time, Peter said, Is it right to hear God's word or the word of man? You be the judge. God tells us to say the name of Jesus Christ, yet you tell us to never say it. Is it right to listen to God's word or the words of a man? In front of men, we are not sinners, but coram deo, we are sinners before God. Wearing a linen ephod, David was standing before the Lord with all his might. Speaking of David's identity, he was a king, a general, a warrior, and a poet. But the most important thing that he was, was God's servant. The Holy Spirit was within David. Joy came pouring out of his heart when the ark arrived at Jerusalem, and the king began to dance. The people also began to dance with them. The prestigious, dignified, and well-respected king began to dance in front of the people with no qualms about his appearance. He danced so enthusiastically that his clothes fell to the ground. David's wife, Michael, heard the loud ruckus and looked out the window to see her husband, King David, and many people dancing outside. My, oh my, the king is running around and dancing with all those people. He was a shepherd, born of lower class, so it cannot be helped. In the eyes of men, what David was doing seemed ridiculous. He was dancing outside, despite the fact that he was stripped of his clothes. Coram omnibus. In the eyes of man, this is how it looked. Michael was the daughter of King Saul. She grew up surrounded by the culture of the royal palace. Her values lied in the consideration for the king's image and the authority of the monarch. Michael believed that the king should walk elegantly, use authoritative words, and be dignified in front of the people. But the king doesn't even know that his clothes have been stripped, and yet he continues to dance with the people. What a disgrace! After the people had finished celebrating, David went to go find his first wife, Michael. He wanted to share the joy he felt in his heart with her. He wanted to bless Michael, but Michael did not know great David's gracious heart and said to him, How you, the king of Israel, have distinguished yourself today, going around half-naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David was angry when he heard Michael say these things. Her words for David were scornful, and she made David's origin seem shameful. David's response to her words made it impossible for Michael to say anything in response. David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. Before the Lord. I emphasize on that before the Lord again. Coram Dale, you don't want to be entirely reverent before God. You can also be like a child in front of him and express your feelings. When you worship before the Lord, you can cry when you want to cry. You can laugh when you want to laugh. You can shout when you want to shout. You can clap when you want to clap. And you can dance if you want to dance. If you dance in front of a person, laugh in front of them, or cry in front of them, they may scorn you, 
But before God, it is but a small child's passion. In front of him, we take off our crown. The general puts his weapon down. There is no need to act poised. We give our hearts to him and glorify him. What creature can turn their head away from God, our creator? Honoring God is being honest with him, like a child would be. To scorn him is to wear a mask before him. Have you ever thought to bring a mask when you were going to worship? When you wear the mask, you'll say, I love you. But truthfully, without the mask, you frown, scowl, and laugh at that person. <laughs> when you wear the mask, you'll say, I love you. But in reality, when you take off the mask, you'll admit, I've always hated you. God knows exactly what we're thinking. Look at what David said to Michael after a rude words towards him. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. <clears throat> after David became angry, he did not go to Michael's room ever again, and she had no children. Or it could be that since Michael held God's worshiper David in contempt, God may have closed her womb so that she could not conceive. But either way, Michael was not blessed with children, and she did not live like a worshiper. She may have been alive, but she had no life. She lived in such a way and died. One does not lose their job or suddenly have their child become sick because they fail to worship. However, even if you have a job and your child is healthy, this life has no life. You will live like that and die like that. Just like Michael, you would live a life without vitality, and then it would just end. It is a life that does not experience God, quoram Deo, before God. If spiritual life flows into you, then tears will fall from your eyes naturally. You will be thrilled. You will repent. You will feel commitment to devotion. There is a new goal in your life. There was a bishop by the name of John Chrysostom. The influence of his church was widespread. In a village beyond the mountain where a few people who went to his church lived, there was one man, a farmer, with particularly good faith. Chrysostom gave that farmer education as a priest and appointed him as a priest. However, Chrysostom was worried that since the man was a humble farmer, he may not be able to teach or do the communion service properly. One day, Chrysostom secretly went to the worship hall and hid in the back to listen to the farmer's service. Tears fell from his face. He had never seen such an earnest prayer. His sermon did not have brilliant rhetorics or riddles, but he delivered that message with all his heart. The praise songs were filled with the Holy Spirit. The communion service began, but Chrysostom could not eat the bread or lift the cup. How could a sinner like I eat this bread and lift this cup? Chrysostom felt the presence of the Holy Spirit in the worship led by the farmer he believed to be ignorant. He received grace. When the service was over, Chrysostom went forward, knelt down, and asked the farmer to pray for him. The farmer saw the bishop and thought, How could I possibly pray for the bishop? But Chrysostom insisted, saying, I have never seen such a passionate and moving worship as I have today. Please pray for me. He is retired in Korea now, but there was once a pastor named Choi bok in my denomination. He was a great minister, but his heart grew heavy and sick. At one point, his grace had been exhausted. It was then that the elementary school children had a summer church retreat by a river in Pocheon. The children were praying at night when suddenly one child had the Holy Spirit come down upon him. The child began to cry and was filled with grace as he began to speak in tongues. He thought, I should be prayed for by that child. So he said, Child, please put your hands on my head and pray for me. The child was very surprised and told the pastor that he couldn't. He thought, There's no way someone like me can pray for the pastor. This was the testimony the pastor gave, and I thought that this pastor was very humble. Before God, we need to pour everything out within us and fill that space with God instead. What is a true Christian's life goal? What kind of perspective should everyone living here on earth live with? We must live with an awareness of mind before God. An awareness of mind means knowing that you are always before God. He is always listening and watching over you. 
Faith is living with God and speaking the truth. It's to open the door to your heart, let God in, and receive his guidance. Other things may be questionable, but you never have to doubt God. Other things can be replaced, but God is irreplaceable. There are other things that we can give up in life, but faith alone is something we cannot give up no matter what. Everyone, if you let go of prayer, you lose one of your sources of communication with God. We have to hold on to prayer. That way, we can connect with God. Faith makes you free. It does not repress you. Because God is with you, you can forgive people without hating them. And because of forgiveness, you are not tied down, but you are free. Worship is confessing that you are not the master of your life. Even money, which many people love so much, is not the master of one's life. That is why we pay tithes by that confession. Honor and power are important, but it cannot be the confession of your life. If you get caught up in it, your life becomes miserable. You will always be worried about what others think of you. In the Old Testament, there was a man named Korah who was famous for agitating people. He ended up receiving God's judgment when the earth split and swallowed him whole. In Moses' Midrash, Korah managed the king's property. At the time, there was a saying, Do not boast your money, wealth, or jewelry in front of Korah. This was because Korah became more and more arrogant and prideful when others flaunted what they had. Korah was good at whipping up anger among the people, and so he managed to gather 250 chieftains who agreed to follow him. The agitated forces of Korah had considerable influence. Despite this, they were all consumed by the earth by the judgment of God. Korah, his family, and his followers were punished. Korah's claim was to make the high priest or priesthood job fair. Why should only Aaron's clan be among the Levites allowed to take on this duty? You don't have to agree with unrighteous things. However, there are those who think about righteousness and fail to understand the person they're facing. Because of this, they choose to follow that person in doing unrighteous things. Eventually, both the original agitator and the follower will be judged together. Korah ran around spreading the slanderous news that Moses had killed an Egyptian. He also lied and said that when the Red Sea was obstructing their path, Moses said that they should return to Egypt. Korah denounced Moses in front of the people and stirred up a rebellion. It was then that God separated the earth with an earthquake, and it was not until he was sucked into the ground that he cried out for his wrongdoings for the first time. Save us! Oh Moses, we are wrong! In Numbers 16 verse 34, it says all Israel around him heard the cry, but it was too late to receive forgiveness, and there was no time for the remission of their sins. Because of pride, Korah forgot that he was before God. Everyone, give your time to God first. No matter who you meet, and no matter what you do, you are always before God. If you keep this in mind, you can become faithful, and we can dedicate ourselves to God. If you're a student and you cheat on your test, knowing you are before God, you will stop cheating. Then, you can study instead. If you're an employee, the work you've done so far has been to earn a salary, but before God, your job would provide you happiness and end up being beneficial to you as well. An employer thought that his subordinate was nothing more than a money-making machine, but before God, he treats them properly based on their character. And a doctor who saw patients as money would change his ways before God and treat his patients like his family, as if they were his own parents or child. Before God, you will realize the value of life. Koram Deo, you must decide your values before God. Now that you are before God, you live knowing that God is with you. You have the wisdom to know what to do and what not to do. In our lives, Koram Deo, in the presence of God, please, Think about the things you do.